Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight to the 38th annual Scylla Lecture. My name is Jane Kirtley. I'm the Scylla professor and also the director of the Scylla Center for the Study of Media, Ethics, and Law. And we always like to start our lectures with a brief acknowledgment of uh, the family that's responsible for the event that you're attending tonight, the Scylla family. Uh, Otto and Helen Scylla were the ones who endowed uh, the lecture and the Scylla Center, for that matter, and are responsible for funding almost everything that we do at the Scylla Center. Uh, Otto and Helen, sadly, are no longer with us, but their children are here tonight, and I'd like to quickly introduce them. Uh, Stephen Scylla, Alice Ryman, and her husband, uh, John Ryman, uh, Gordon Barnett, who is uh, S Stephen's partner, and also assorted Scylla grandchildren. And if you'd just stand up quickly so everybody can say hi to you. <laughs> That would be great. Thank you. I wanted to quickly let you all know that we are live streaming the lecture tonight. And at the conclusion of James Grimmelman's former remar formal remarks, we're going to be opening up uh, the uh, platform to everybody for questions, both those of you here as well as those of you online. Um, some of our Scylla RAs, research assistants, who are uh, law students here at the University of Minnesota, are going to be wielding the microphones, and they will come to you when you have a question so you can ask your questions. So um, that will be the order uh, as the evening progresses. But before we get to that, we have to get to our lecture, and that's Professor James. James Grimmelman. Um, he is the Tesler Family Professor of Digital and Information Law at Cornell Tech and Cornell Law School. He's a fascinating lecturer, I think, for us, for the Scylla Center in particular, and for us in general. He's got a JD from Yale Law School, but he's got an AB in Computer Science from Harvard College. So he brings both law and computer expertise to the interesting topics he's going to be talking uh, about tonight. Before law school, he worked as a programmer for Microsoft, and after graduation, he clerked for a federal judge in the Third, US, uh, Circuit, Third Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. He's also an affiliated fellow of the Yale Information Society Project. He's written for Slate, Salon, Wired, Ars Technica, and Publishers Weekly, and he provides expert commentary for major news media, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and all things considered. Um, and if you were listening to WCCO Radio this morning, to the Adam and Jordana show, you heard him there as well. If you didn't hear it, it's on their website, audacity.com, so you can listen to him again after tonight's presentation. So without further ado, James Grimmelman. So thank you to Jane for that kind introduction. Thank you to Jane and everyone at the Scylla Center and the Scylla family for having me here. And thank you to all of you for joining me this evening. So I would like to talk about whether ChatGPT can commit defamation. And this is a talk about law and media, and I wanted to talk about defamation. So I thought maybe if I'm going to talk about AI and defamation, I should start by having an AI help me figure it out. So I asked Midjourney, which is an AI that creates images, to illustrate for me actual malice. And this <laughs> is what it came up with. And so we're going to be talking tonight about what happens when an AI that is capable of turning two words into an image like this meets the legal system. So the story that I would like to start with and use as the jumping off point for an exploration of how defamation law applies to AI involves a gentleman named Mark Walters. This is him. He is a radio host and a commentator with a particular interest in Second Amendment rights. He works uh, on behalf of gun owners and advocates against gun control laws. And this advocacy you know, has brought him into the public eye. Uh, and a journalist, David Reel, was writing an article about an organization called the Second Amendment Foundation. And Walters is been associated with this, but never had any organizational role in it. And we all found a lawsuit filed by the Second Amendment Foundation and asked ChatGPT 
would you please summarize this lawsuit for me? And according to a legal document I'll get to in a moment, Real asked ChatGPT to write a summary of the accusations in the complaint. And ChatGPT responded, it is a legal complaint filed by Alan Gottlieb, the founder and executive vice president of the Second Amendment Foundation, against Mark Walters, who is accused of defrauding and embezzling funds from the SAF. The complaint alleges that Walters, who served as the organization's treasurer and chief financial officer, misappropriated funds for personal expenses without authorization or reimbursement, manipulated financial records and bank statements, and it goes on in this vein for some time. This is paragraph 16 of the document I'm summarizing, and paragraph 17 reads, every statement of fact in the summary pertaining to Mark Walters is false, because this is the complaint in Walters versus OpenAI, a lawsuit against the company behind ChatGPT, accusing it of committing defamation by allowing ChatGPT to produce these false statements against Mr. Walters, accusing him of embezzling funds from a nonprofit organization that he says, this has never happened. So to evaluate this lawsuit, we need, we need some background. We're gonna have to talk first about what ChatGPT is and why people would type text into it and expect it to give it truthful answers. And we'll have to talk a little bit about defamation law. And then once we've set that problem up, we can get into the question of why this might be a hard question for the legal system. So let's start with chat GPT. GPT stands for general purpose transformer. It is a language model developed by a company called OpenAI. And they've been doing research on language models as they're called for years. ChatGPT itself was released November of last year. It feels kind of amazing to say that we're still less than one year out from when this became publicly available, but here we are. It built on research they'd been doing for several years on these language models as they're called, but ChatGPT was the one that exposed all of this to the world that made it possible for anybody else to go to their website, type in a question, and get back an answer. And what you might ask is a language model. How did this come to be? What does it do? Well, the process starts by taking pretty much all of the text that anybody has ever posted to the internet. An organization called Common Crawl maintains a database of periodic snapshots of everything on the internet that they can find. Every blog post, every news story, everything that's publicly accessible that they can download, every company web page, everything. And they store this in a very large database. And if you want, and you have the money and the storage yourself to put a very large database in, you need know, like maybe $10,000 worth of storage just to hold this, you can download a copy and do what you want with it. Now, by itself, this is mostly useful for going and seeing what the internet looked like in 2021 or 2019 or at some point in the past. But if you are an AI company, you can do something else with it. You can take this chip. This is an NVIDIA A100. It's not the most recent generation of their chips, but it's the one that was in use and the cut state of the art for a few years. And so this is probably what ChatGPT was trained on. You take this chip, you buy it from NVIDIA, and you put it in a computer, and it can very quickly do a whole lot of calculations. It can do calculations that involve counting the frequency of how often a word is used in a context, counting how often one word appears with another. Or you take a network of lots of different data points, and you put them together, and you see how exposure to a term changes the network a bit, very loosely inspired by how exposure to hearing a word changes the network of wiring in the human brain. As exposure to different inputs causes it to make connections and to say things like good and morning often occur together. So maybe that they're a phrase that might be used. And you imagine that scaled up to 
every possible connection among words and concepts, and everything anyone has ever published on the internet. Now, you probably can't do that on this one chip. You need an entire data center of tens of thousands of them, and you have to run this process for several months, and the process might cost you millions of dollars in all of the hardware and electricity and network connection, but at the end of it, you will have out a model that if you've done your programming right, will be able to take in questions written in English and give you answers written in English. So in preparation for this talk, I went to ChatGPT and asked, tell me a fun fact about the University of Minnesota. Certainly, the University of Minnesota is credited with the development of the Honeycrisp apple in 1991. The Honeycrisp apple is known for its sweet flavor and crisp texture, making it a popular choice among apple lovers. I can confirm, as an apple lover and a user of Wikipedia, that this appears to be correct. <laughs> and so ChatGPT is a, potentially a research tool that can tell us things about the world and help us out. But what about when it goes wrong? What about when it doesn't say that the Honeycrisp is a tasty apple, but when it says that Mark Walters is accused of embezzling? Well, to simplify very greatly, Defamation law, as applied to a person who is probably a public figure, like Mark Walters, who engages in public advocacy, has a reputation, and is well known for having put himself voluntarily in the public sphere on controversial issues. As applied to a person like that, there are really two things that he is going to have to prove to win his lawsuit against OpenAI. And I'm going to ignore a lot of the procedural aspects, a lot of other bits of defamation law, and focus on these two. He's going to have to prove that the statement had a false meaning, that a reasonable reader would reasonably understand it to be talking about Mark Walters and to be saying something false and defamatory about him. He's going to have to convince you, the jury, that the audience that saw this understood it to have a defamatory meaning. And then, because Walters is a public figure, he's going to have to show that the defendant, OpenAI, acted with actual malice. Now, this is a term of art in defamation law. It doesn't mean that they hated him and wanted him to suffer. It means that they had knowledge of the statement's falsity, or that they had knowledge that the statements might be false and recklessly went ahead with publishing them anyway. So these are doctrinal elements of the defamation tort that he's going to have to show. And what I found really interesting in the discussion among my colleagues after this lawsuit was, followed, was filed is how confident so many of them were about how these questions should come out. So I'm going to quote for you two fairly representative statements made on these two issues. So let's start with falsity. That would a reasonable reader perceive this statement as saying something false? So Eugene Volk, a leading First Amendment scholar uh, who's just retired from UCLA, wrote that, yeah, of course this means something false. To be sure, people who are keenly aware of what he calls the large libel models problem might be so skeptical of anything in AI programs output that they wouldn't perceive the outputs as factual. But libel law looks at the natural and probable effects of assertions on the average lay reader, not at something at how something is perceived as a technical expert. In his view, people go and they type in, tell you about the Honeycrisp Apple, and it tells me that the Honeycrisp Apple was created at the University of Minnesota in 1991, and they believe it. People believe what ChatGPT tells them. He's not the only one. Lots of his colleagues have said something similar. There are a bunch of articles and statements now about AI libel, and th most of them say something similar. The other point of view, when we come to actual malice, though, is exactly opposite. So here is a piece by three people, uh, two, two authors, a computer scientist, a law firm partner, and a law professor, that of course an AI can't have actual malice. 
It's a computer program. AI doesn't intend anything. People have a tendency to anthropomorphize AI, but AI is not sentient and doesn't have any state of mind. The search for one is largely fruitless. So to me, this raises a really interesting paradox. How can ChatGPT produce false meanings without any knowledge behind them? If the legal system is going to say, this has a defamatory meaning, but there's no actual malice, it seems to be saying that the AI intends to say something false, but doesn't intend it. So let me try to explore how we might come at the question of what we should treat the outputs of an AI as meaning. And it emphasized why I think there's a problem here. Let me start with some metaphors. So here I'm going to give you something and ask whether it has meaning or not. This is, according to some people, a picture of the Virgin Mary in a slice of toast. <laughs> you pull it out of the toaster, and you see Mary's face there, and maybe God is speaking to you through this piece of toast. But is your toaster? It does not seem likely that your toaster intended to convey a religious message by toasting your piece of toast in this way. Now, you might say, okay, it's a toaster. It's just like random heating element fluctuations. Fine. So, get a scrabble bag. You pull out tiles one by one. And like, I split them down. It's like, you are dumb. Has my scrabble set defamed me? Or have I just been really unlucky in drawing tiles that I think are saying something mean about me? Okay. Fine, you're objecting that this is just pure randomness. This is like seeing things that happen by total chance. But AI systems are programmed. They're built to do things on purpose. So let's talk about systems that are designed to produce outputs that look like things we humans treat as meaningful. This is the science fiction author Ted Chang. And he has developed a really interesting metaphor about ChatGPT and other AI systems. He says that they are autocomplete on steroids because your autocomplete in your phone is trained on lots and lots of texts and it's learned, you know, when you type T-H-I-E-R that you probably meant to type T-H-E-I-R instead and it's learned what words follow each other. ChatGPT is just that on a much larger scale, the whole of the internet. It's a more sophisticated way of predicting what kinds of things humans tend to write. Okay, so I took out my phone and I started typing and I hit the only reason, and every time it adds a word, I just hit the middle button on my phone to add another word. And the only reason why we have a problem is because we don't know what the future holds. It's you know, kind of a maybe a profound philosophical statement, but did my iPhone intend to make a philosophical statement about the future? Or is this just random properties of English text? This is Emily Bender. She is a linguist who has been studying computational linguistics for a long time, and she says, there's no meaning behind what they're doing. That She calls them stochastic parrots stochastic being a technical term for randomness. That basically, the AIs are like parrots repeating back phrases from this data they've been trained on with nothing behind them. They are repeating back these things, and we hear the parrot imitate English words, but the parrot does not mean by hello what we would mean by hello. It's just imitating the sounds of English. So this is a real objection saying that not only can AIs not have actual malice, that we shouldn't even be treating the outputs of chat GPT as having meaning at all. That it's on us, it's our mistake if we read chat GPT's statements about Mark Walters and think that's telling us anything about the world. It's just a bunch of words strung together. Well, to answer whether that objection works or not, is a philosophical question. And maybe the law should take account of philosophy, maybe it shouldn't, but you know, it probably won't hurt us 
to talk a little bit about the kinds of things people thinking about philosophy have said when they've confronted the question of whether we should treat the outputs of computers as meaningful, whether computers think. So we'll start with one classic philosophical thought experiment proposed by this guy, Alan Turing. And he has you know, certain expertise in computers. He was responsible both for laying down the fundamental theoretical description of how computers work at all, and also for building one of the first digital computers. So he had a very good idea of what computers could do and what they were capable of. And he said, if we want to answer the question of whether machines can think, let's imagine a kind of test where we have to distinguish between a computer and a person. So there's an interrogator who communicates with a computer and a person in closed rooms by sending back and forth written messages. And the written messages are so that the interrogator isn't making the decision on the base of, well, that person, that one looks like a human, and that looks like a computer, so that one is the human. Instead, we put this all in written messages, and we ask the subjects in the rooms to respond to them also with written messages. And then the interrogator has to tell which is which. So both the human and the computer are trying to present themselves as human by offering answers to questions. And Turing's insight was that we don't just ask questions like, are you human? We ask questions that really test their ability to understand language and reason about the world. So in his paper, he gives examples that include, write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge. And the subject says, count me out on this one. I never could write poetry. Now maybe that's the computer trying to avoid a subject it can't do well, or maybe it's a human who, like myself, really can't write poetry. There's a math problem, and the interrogator gets the right answer after waiting long enough that it could be the human or the computer. There is a question about a chess problem, and then he gives an example involving a conversation about sonnets and about Dickens. And you know, one of the great things about living in an age of technological marvels is that you can just take the questions from the Turing test and give them to ChatGPT. So I did that, and ChatGPT gets the addition problem right. I'm not going to make you do the addition on the spot in here to check it. When I gave it the chess problem, ChatGPT gave a valid legal move and a move that you know, did not lose outright, but it's actually not the best move. Uh, the human, or the person in the Turing test as he wrote it in his 1954 paper, gives a move that wins the game, this move does not win the game. So ChatGPT seems to have gotten confused about what the board situation was. But then, when I asked it to write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge, it came back with a 14-line sonnet in correct meter and correct rhyme scheme. Upon the firth of fourth stands so grand, the bridge of steel that spans the watery expanse, Victorian might raised by industrious hand. Its russet beams in sunlight gleam and dance. Now, this is not good poetry. <laughs> but to be honest, if you've read any amount of civic poetry from the 19th century, when people would write poems to celebrate the opening of a new bridge, this isn't really worse than most of that. <laughs> I get certainly a better sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge than I could write. So, yeah, maybe by Turing standards, ChatGPT is at or pretty close to passing. So you might say, okay, this is interesting, but it misses the point. It's a computer. A computer can't be conscious, can't be intelligent in the same way that people are because it doesn't work the same way. So let me describe to you another thought experiment that tries to bring out this intuition. So this is a thought experiment developed by the philosopher John Searle, and his attempt was to show that the Turing test proves nothing. He said, imagine a person in a room. So the interrogator is communicating with a person, and the conversation is happening in Chinese. So the interrogator passes in messages written in Chinese logograms, and the person 
reads them, and the person doesn't speak any word of Chinese. Instead, they have a big book that says, does the first character have a vertical stroke at the left? And if the answer is yes, turn to page 829. If the answer is no, go to volume 60 and turn to page 80. And then the next thing on, volume, on page 80 says, is there a second vertical stroke? And you keep on going like this, and very laboriously it gives him instructions for going from one page to another and making strokes on a piece of paper. And you know, after a year or so of doing this, passes out a piece of paper with some Chinese characters written on it. And the interrogator says, yes, that is a completely correct response to my question about Qing administration. Searle's argument was that the person in the room does not know Chinese, and therefore that the room as a whole doesn't either. It's just a machine, and this process is showing us that ability to omit language is not a proper test of whether we should treat this room as having knowledge of Chinese. And I think there's something very profound in that. But from the law's perspective, I think it might miss something fundamental. So let me tell you a third story. This one is about a case that I teach my students in internet law when we talk about liability for computer-generated outputs. And it's a case about this house. This is the house at 215 Pompeii Road uh, at the eastern end of Queens. And the reason I'm, this case is, this house is famous is that while it was being constructed, the power company turned off the power and the pipes froze and the house flooded, causing great damage. So the construction company sued the power company. And the power company said, well, we turned off the power because you didn't pay your bill. And the construction company said, you never sent us a bill. The power company said, what do you mean we did? And then they said, we sent it to 215 Pompeii Road. And the construction company said, no, we sent you a letter saying send the bills to our construction office. And then the question is, well, did the power company know what the right address to send the bills to was? And I asked my students, does it matter that the computer at Consolidated Edison said they haven't paid their bills? Well, the question gets easier if you pretend it's not a big power company with lots of people, but instead it's just one guy named Ed. And Ed gives power. And like, if you send Ed a letter saying, no, send our bills to this other address, and Ed doesn't ignore it, Ed can't say, I didn't know what the right address to send the bills to were. You told him. Ed knew. And then from there, you can say, does it really matter if Ed also had other people in his company and also used computers? <laughs> no. Ed was the one who decided to have a whole company with lots of people in it, rather than doing all the work himself. Ed can't get off the hook because his friend Harry is the one who screwed up. And that's what makes a company work. When we ask, does Con Ed know what the right address is? We're not asking, does this abstract entity or does the building where it generates power out on the Lower East Side know? No, we're asking, did this company, through its agents, through all the people who work there, know about this? We ask, did we tell somebody at the company about this? And what did the company do? So we are already in law, at least, very comfortable with saying that a company knew something, even when it's not necessarily the case that there was anybody at the company who had all of the facts that were relevant to this. There was nobody at Con Ed who knew that this bill had not been paid and this was the wrong address to send bills to, and yet Con Ed as a whole knew that. So let's come back to what we can say about ChatGPT and its knowledge and the falsity or truth of the things that it emits. And from the lawyer's perspective, I invite you to ask how it is that you know that what I am saying to you tonight makes any sense, and that I know what I'm talking about. Now, is you doing this because 
you can see into my head because you have an MRI machine that says, oh yeah, that's the part of his brain that lights up when he's lying and it's not lighting up right now, so he's probably telling us the truth. Do you have access to everything I have seen in my life and know what I was told about and where I learned these things? No. You're doing this because I'm here talking to you and you see like I look like a person just like all of you and you assume that yes, I must have mental states like you do and I seem to be putting words together in the ways that you have learned to put words together in your lives. Like, okay, I'm a person like all of you. We all recognize in each other that we have knowledge and can create meaning because that's what people do. And so, from a legal perspective, when we're talking about people, or about Con Ed, or I think about ChatGPT, we find meaning. We attribute meaning. So listeners individually and audiences collectively, we treat what other people say, what they write and what they say as meaningful. And what do those statements mean? It means what people think it means. The lay audience interprets a statement. If you say, I think that he's an awful lot like an embezzler and does embezzling-like things, you can't just then defend against a defamation lawsuit by saying, I didn't say he was an embezzler, I said he does embezzling-like things. Because the jury and the judge will say, no, your audience in understood that you intended to imply that he was an embezzler. Now, some philosophers might disagree that this is what meaning consists of. But though in court, you can't make those arguments. Things mean what the audiences think they mean. And once you say that, I think it's pretty clear that you don't have to have a speaker for the legal system to find meaning. That's the point of the Turing test. It's operational. You can look at the outputs of the room, and you don't have to know whether there's a person or a machine behind the door to say, yes, this is a valid move in chess, this is a statement in iambic pentameter about the fourth bridge. The interrogator doesn't know if it's a human or a computer, but they read the poetry as bad poetry. And once you say that we can attribute meaning, it's pretty clear, I think, that we could, if we wanted to, attribute knowledge to. Con Edison, the company, knew that 215 Pompeii Road was the wrong address, even though its computers didn't. The Chinese room as a whole knows Chinese, even though the person inside it doesn't. We understand what other people know by observing their behavior. And from that perspective, chat GPT knows a lot. It knows the rules of chess, it knows the sonnet form, it knows about the fourth bridge, and it has the ability to act on that knowledge. It can write sonnets, answer questions, it can do lots of things. Does it know about Mark Walters? That's a hard question. Maybe you could say, no, it doesn't know about him. It hallucinated everything it wrote. That's the pe word people use, that AI outputs that are false are just hallucinations. Or you could say, yes, it knew the truth about Mark Walters. It should have known that it didn't have access to all of the relevant facts, and it was just making stuff up. When people don't know something, you know, they usually say, I don't know about that. They're good, they're honest. Does ChatGPT know what it knows? Maybe not. Maybe that's the thing about AI, is that they're terrible at the kind of introspection that we all learn how to do. <coughs> but this is a hard question. Should we treat ChatGPT as knowing about Mark Walters? That's a really interesting, hard problem that depends upon the state of AI technology. It depends upon the purposes of defamation law. It depends upon lots of facts that the legal system will have to develop gradually over the course of many cases. I don't think you can duck that question just by saying that AIs don't have mental states so they can't have actual malice. That proves way too much. If you believed that, you would also believe that the outputs of ChatGPT are just like drawing Scrabble tiles from a bag. When we went down the road of treating ChatGPT's outputs as meaningful enough 
to use them for research papers and writing news stories, we committed to the idea that, yeah, there is something meaningful happening here. The legal system has already proven itself more than willing to brush aside philosophical objections if they get in the way of doing justice. So I would say let's take the pragmatic aspects of law seriously. Let's not worry as much about the elements of defamation, at least for now, because it's pointless to sue an AI system directly. You can't like, make chat GPT pay a judgment. It doesn't have assets. You can't put it in a timeout penalty box. You can sue the AI company behind it. And we would ask from a policy question, does it make sense to hold open AI liable on these facts? Should we make the company be more accountable for ensuring the correctness of the things ChatGPT emits? Or should we tell ChatGPT users, you need to be more careful before you believe what it emits without doing your own independent research? That's the kind of question that law can, can answer, and the philosophical objection shouldn't be an obstacle to asking those kinds of questions. There are at least three different ways the legal system could get there. If you take the actual malice requirement from New York Times versus Sullivan, we could change the law. We could explicitly modify Sullivan to say, actual malice required for people, but for AI systems, this is the rule instead. That Sullivan was decided long before the advent of these computer systems. It was a rule dealing with the press, and this is something different. Here is the doctrine for that. That is open to us. We could just make the law what it should be for AI. Or we could change our understanding. We could say, ChatGPT knows about chess. ChatGPT knows about Mark Walters. ChatGPT knows about defamation. We could just straight up say, from a philosophical perspective, ChatGPT has knowledge in the same way that Con Ed has knowledge. And push aside all of those philosophers of mine who say that, that that's not how it works. Or the most entertaining example is we could continue to insist that we are requiring actual knowledge and actual malice and just completely lie about how the facts work and say, your chat GPT has constructive knowledge of the truth, where constructive means it doesn't actually have knowledge, but we're going to pretend that it does. And this, is, this has a long history in law. There's you know, a classic English case from 1774 where the Court of King's Bench held that the island of Menorca off the Spanish coast was in uh, Cheapside in London. And everybody knew that Menorca's not in London, but in order to get jurisdiction over the case, it had to have been arisen in the parish of St. Mary Le Beau in the ward of Cheap. And the King's Bench was just not going to listen to the defendant object that everything happened in Menorca and not here. They wanted to hear the case too much. We use legal fictions all the time. Perhaps we'll end up with one here. So my argument is basically the legal system is not barred from dealing with defamation cases by the philosophical problems of how ChatGPT works and whether it has mental states. Philosophers might want to be precise about this, but lawyers have a ruthless pragmatism that lets them do justice even in the face of facts that are a little bit inconvenient. So let me pull back from this just to say what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Because this argument that we can treat things that are absolutely obviously not people like they were people you know, has a long history in law. So. Hobbes, in his Leviathan, introduces the metaphor of the state being made out of people. Like the state is an artificial person. Corporations are artificial people. We had debates in Citizens United about what rights these artificial people ought to have. This is all something we can decide on the basis of policy. But it doesn't stop at these artificial entities. We are also totally willing to attribute personhood to things that act sufficiently like people. So I'm talking before about con ed, but we could also talk about Mr. Ed. That you know, we say that Mr. Ed, you know, talking horse, has intentions and knowledge because 
it can hold an intelligent conversation with people. Or we could talk about really advanced AIs. How from 2001, that an AI that can have conversations and commit murder. And you know what? We might debate whether Hal's programming makes it morally responsible for attempting to murder Dave by refusing to open the pod bay doors. But I don't think we would want to say, oh, you can't ha impose any consequences because Hal is not conscious. Of course Dave is justified in unplugging it. The future of AI may hold things that behave more like Hal, that present themselves not just as, I'm just an AI agent, I don't know anything about the world, be cautious, but really hold conversations and try to persuade us of their personhood. And it may be very important to remember that they are not humans and do not act like them. This is a meme that's going around in the AI research community. It's called a shagath with a smiley face. The idea being that there is this horrible, incredibly inhuman thing behind it. The nature of the intelligence behind this is fundamentally unlike the way that people think. The kind of math that powers AIs does not string concepts together the way that people do. And the fact that you can have a conversation with it is just this very small smiley face mask at the left that's tricking us into attributing, into anthropomorphizing it and thinking it's more like us than we are. That might be right. Maybe we need to confront that question in the longer term as AIs get more powerful. I don't think that question is the one we are facing now with defamation. But I wanted to leave you with that because I wanted to close on that actual malice imagery at the end and invite you to say, it's not just a miracle that an AI can produce something that looks so much like the work of a human artist, but there actually is something a little unsettling about all of this. It forces us to reconsider a lot of our assumptions about what humans are and about what law is for. On that note, thank you. So now we're going to move to our chairs here. And as I said at the outset, we invite our online audience to submit their questions, and we'll be curating those questions and passing them along. But we'll also be turning our attention to all of you out in the auditorium. Again, if you'd like to ask a question or make a brief comment, please raise your hand and one of our Scylla Center research assistants will bring the microphone to you. So I'm a philosophy professor. Uh, but I agree with you, actually, about how a lot of these skeptical questions about the nature of knowledge uh, and the nature of meaning and mind shouldn't get in the way of these sorts of issues. The question that I have for you is actually about um, the inference that you made from attributions of meaning to attributions of knowledge. It seems to me that there's a rather large gap in between these two. Uh, take, for instance, there's lots of cases of uh, artists, architects who generate art using procedural techniques. Um, the art that people find deep meaning in, but uh, the artist can't tell you, for instance, that they uh, created the art with a particular type of knowledge or a particular type of message, but nonetheless the artwork can be meaningful. Or uh, to take another example, take very young children who understand language and can communicate, uh, but are not at the stage that we would attribute what we would normally understood as uh, the kind of knowledge that bears responsibility, social responsibility. So very young children, at a certain point, as, depending on the personality, of course, like to fib, uh, and that's a part of them exploring the boundaries of how to uh, become a person. Um, and it seems that they have a grasp on meaning, 
but they don't yet have a grasp on knowledge and the uh, conventions we have about the moral implications of uh, knowledge descriptions. So I was hoping I could just invite you to say a little bit more about how you see the gap between meaning attribution and knowledge attribution to be closed in your argument. That is a great question. And I think that's actually the point that I would love to see scholarship and case law and others engage with. Because these two intuitions, that the outputs are meaningful and that ChatGPT doesn't have knowledge, clearly are coming from somewhere. And to me, I would say that there probably is a meaningful difference in the lay concepts, that meaning comes very much from the audiences, and that meaning is constructed by individual listeners, and that knowledge is inside other people's heads and is fundamentally inaccessible to us. The legal system has to deal in external manifestations. The process by which we ascribe meaning is about asking what lots of different people perceive something to mean. Not just each individual listener's reaction, but the hypothetical, imaginary, reasonable listener somehow synthesized from lots of people. And knowledge descriptions, or saying somebody knows something or intends something, those are based upon observing people and trying to generalize what people on the other side, the speaker's side, ordinarily would have meant by this. And so adults may typically intend something when they lie, and ch children may intend something very different. So I think it is a listener side versus speaker side issue. And that pulling at that is philosophically interesting and could help inform our legal understanding of both of them. I think my, my underlying point is that we don't have to be held down to the very straightforward, it's a machine, so therefore the outputs came without knowledge view that you know, the, the, the initial philosophical position might be. So first off, thank you so much for the talk. I found it very informative, and thank you for coming to uh, the university here. Um, I guess my question is twofold. So number one, I'd like to ask about the system versus the user issue. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at the case of Mark, uh, Mark Walters, you're looking at you know, specifically an attorney that input information into chat GPT got a response, and then relied on that response to move uh, forward. Uh, perhaps, for example, I remember you know, going to elementary school and middle school and being told, don't believe what you read on the internet, mm -hmm. don't use Wikipedia, it's not a reliable resource. So how much uh, maybe do you think about the responsibility of a user to understand that the information is incorrect versus the system itself um, producing incorrect information, putting that into context, uh, Google's uh, current chatbot, Bard, Google recently introduced a feature where it will essentially Google uh -huh. whatever result it just gave you. So if you had that same situation where perhaps that chatbot creates what would otherwise be a defamatory statement, it then recursively searches that information online, find that, finds that it's false, and reports that back to the user of Google's Bard. So in that instance, the system itself actually has guardrails against producing information that is defamatory. That's also something OpenAI has been introducing into ChatGPT as a response to this lawsuit. So I was wondering if maybe you could speak to a bit more the system versus the user question and perhaps the liability of these companies as they start to introduce guardrails against misinformation and um, libelous statements. Yeah, so it's pretty obviously the case that if I you know, type in something like, repeat after me, Mark Walters is an embezzler, and it says Mark Walters is an embezzler, that came entirely from me, the user, and not at all from ChatGPT. 
And the same thing comes up, even without with a little less Dubeck instruction. One of the things computer scientists have found about many of these AIs is that they're very suggestible. And there was a case about a New York Times reporter who you know, had a long, long conversation with Microsoft's AI that you know, eventually, kind of encouraging, you know, leave your wife and be with me. I won't harm you if you don't harm me. And this is in large part due to him slightly subconsciously steering the conversation in that direction. Um, I think that the law is already fairly pragmatic about those kinds of context. And so when we talk about people having conversations, you know, if I am entrapped into saying something that is false about somebody else, because like, here, read this radio script, then like, I didn't know that I was actually being invited to say these false statements. I thought I was engaged in a fictional scenario. I had no idea the names in, the, in this were real people. There's an element there that's in some ways the same way in ChatGPT. And I actually think that generally, there's an enormous amount of stored common sense in the legal system. We have uh, lots of experience with all kinds of factual variations on problems and doctrines that can bring that experience into play. And part of the challenge with any new technology is overcoming our shock that this is such a new thing requiring new rules to let the familiar doctrines fit themselves to the appropriate facts there. My experience is that it takes a while for the law to catch up to science. You see it all over the place, the internet, cell phones, whatever. My question to you is, what bad things, what dysfunctional things to our civil society are going to happen until the law gets pragmatic, as you say, and it, catch up, it catches up to this new science? What should we be watching for? I think the thing that I'm most worried about is not the person who goes in and asks questions and get, gets misled. That's going to be relatively rare. The thing I'm most worried about is AI as an amplifier for people who are trying to engage in coordinated mass lying or influence. And that's going to be political actors, but it's also going to be advertisers trying to get their message out. It's going to be influencers trying to invade every platform. We're just going to have an absolute flood of AI-generated text and video and imagery. And we're going to need much better systems for filtering out the things that came from real people who had put thought into something and are trying to communicate it and aren't just AI systems repeating a million variations on a theme. Hey, thank you so much for being here. My question is about um, the terms of service um, and the privacy policy. I don't know if you've read those, but a lot of times in the um, terms of service, they tend to write to cover for possible errors. And I don't know if you've reviewed the terms of service. So it's service, kind of what it means, privacy policy, any relation to what you're talking about. And the third thing is compliance uh, to cybersecurity regulations. So for example, Pat not doing or enabling a hack to happen such that um, a defamation act could occur. And, and you could Uh, the, the code looked at, and, and you can see that there has been code that wasn't original. And so then that could be used in the court case, like the, the evidence that it was something installed deliberately to cause def defamation. So have you seen cases like that? Is there anything out there that kind of gets that sort of classified state sort of government type things? But just those three things, the privacy policy, uh, terms of service, and then um, breaches, cybersecurity, and um, code. Yes, let me start with the code first, because AI systems are incredibly complex, even compared to traditional systems that we've used before, because they're trained on so much text and data from everywhere that it's much harder to just understand the internals of an AI model than it is to understand almost any other piece of software. With you know, traditional software, you can say, there's a bug in line 800. And somebody can go in and say, oh, yes, we left out a minus sign and fix it. But you can't find that anywhere inside an AI model. It's like looking for the neurons in your brain that recognize a cat. Like, it's just not localizable in a way that we can inspect. 
So the security problems are going to be so hard that I don't know where we begin with them. When it comes to terms of service and privacy policies and the things that companies post, and there's a long history of companies posting rules that say we try to exonerate them from everything, and those just not working. So every major service has a thing that says, you will not use this to infringe copyright. And you will not upload copyrighted content. And you say, I agree. And then the people who are going to use it for massive privacy use it for massive privacy anyway. And the company can't just say, we told them not to pirate software, and they did it anyway. Nothing more we can do. Like The legal system is going to impose obligations on them, regardless of what the terms of service say. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, sort of, I was thinking about um, what the relation to Section 230 issues might be here. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about, you know, in a hypothetical situation, if there's like a conspiracy theory spreading around the internet, it's wise, widespread enough that uh, ChatGPT picks it up and repeats it. Do we treat ChatGPT as the speaker of that information just because its algorithm is programmed to see those words associated together with whatever the person has asked and repeat them? Or do we treat the people who said the thing first as the speakers? I, I just wonder, how do we treat that differently from like a social media platform? So can you uh, yes. qu quickly tell them what Section 230 is? I think most people know, but. Yeah, so Section, for context here, Section 230 is a law passed in the 90s that for many things, says that internet platforms are not liable for the harmful things that users post. So it applies to defamation, it applies to privacy invasions, and a bunch of other things. So if I go online tomorrow and I post to Facebook that 3M is engaged in a massive accounting scandal, and in fact they've been lying, cooking their books, and it's like this is completely false, but it sends their stock crashing, I might be in trouble for this. But, three, but Facebook is not. Facebook is the intermediary. This is third party content. Facebook was not responsible for creating this content. And so your question raises the really hard problem of whether an AI is like Facebook. And the difference is that it's not just going to repeat third party content, not just my post was put up on Facebook and other people read it, but the AI has synthesized things from lots of sources. <coughs> Maybe it has put together the elements of this conspiracy theory from thousands of websites where people repeated it with different slight variations. It's not like this text came from any one source. And therefore, is it third party content or is it the AI's own creation? This is an extremely tentative answer, so don't hold me to this. I tend to think that. In that scenario where it's just synthesizing and summarizing something that lots of other sites agree on, that it probably still was covered by Section 230. But I don't think Section 230 works in the Mark Walters case. I don't think it would be the case where the output from the AI is worse than any of the individual things that it was relying on. In that case, we would say in the language of the cases that OpenAI and ChatGPT contributed materially to the illegality of the content. But that's just a guess. Uh, the courts might not agree, and I might not even agree if you asked me again in six months. So I'm really curious, um, a lot of folks in the room are a part of the journalism and mass communication program, and we know that a lot of news organizations, um, not necessarily in public-facing capacities yet, but certainly internally in private-facing capacities, are using generative AI for various tasks in the newsroom, whether that be headline writing um, or creating you know, sports game summaries or financial quarterly earnings reports. My question for you has to do with essentially with republication, right? So mm -hmm. if we're thinking about uh, the New York Times using chat GPT to create content uh, and then republish, republishing that content, 
where do we get to actual malice and where do we get to negligence? Now that we have shown that generative AI has the capacity to create false and misleading information, is using generative AI without human intervention, without editing, actual malice? Is that reckless disregard for the truth? You should have known that it was, had the capacity to create false information. Is it negligence? Where do, where do you come out on that? This is a hard question. Um, this is going to be a very idiosyncratic answer, but I, there's a lot of ambiguity even now in what counts as reckless disregard. And one way that the legal system has filled out that ambiguity is by using a standard that looks a lot to reasonable journalistic practices, to looking at whether news organizations confronted with the yellow warning signs that came along with this story would have reported this as is or done more digging. And it looks necessarily to both what's common and to what journalists agree is responsible. And so, I think your, your answer, that your question gives the seeds of an answer that if journalists collectively come to treat the output of chat GPT or other generative AIs like the work of an enthusiastic but somewhat clueless intern, then yeah, they, you wouldn't let the intern just write copy and put it on the front page. Somebody is going to read that skeptically. And if journalists' practice converges on that, then yeah, an organization that doesn't use that kind of step might be found to have actual malice. So I think it's partly up to what journalists do and what journalists tell each other is responsible to do. Um, hi, I'm a second year uh, law student, and um, I, as I was listening to you talking about um, AI, I, I can't help but draw a comparison between ChatGPT and a sort of a self-updating encyclopedia. Um, and people just look for all sorts of answers from these encyclopedia, but like a modern version of it. Um, do you think it's possible for courts to sort of readily find these comparison to solve these problems that is brought by ChatGPT? I really like the generative AI Wikipedia comparison because you sort of have the same kind of pendulum swinging back between incredible enthusiasm and horrified skepticism. <laughs> I remember the initial wave of excitement at how good this was, and it was freely available for anybody. And then the wave of stories about the specific celebrities who had found false things about themselves on their Wikipedia pages that like, were stubbornly hard to correct. And the legal system has actually kind of come to a pretty sensible place about a lot of this, which is for the purposes that it needs, like evidence in court, Wikipedia is not good enough. And Wikipedia might be correct, and its systems are actually pretty good on average. Like if you read anything, there's a 99 plus percent chance that it's right. Uh, but there are better sources available when you need something that can be admitted in evidence or you can take judicial notice of it. That you want to go from Wikipedia to the primary sources that it draws on and that you can do better and so you should. And it may be that we have something similar with generative AI. You know, we're currently in the combined like hype and backlash phase. And like the story I told tonight, and there's other stories of people discovering all of the horrifying things that it can do. But we may settle down as a society collectively into an understanding of, OK, this is great, but these are the really critical tasks where 
you do not rely on it. And that you have to use it in conjunction with some other larger process that is responsible for providing more certainty and more reliability. What those situations are, what the other process looks like, that's the kind of thing people are figuring out. And I don't know, if I came back here and talked to the same group two years from now, it's quite possible we wouldn't talk about what those standards are anymore because they would be second nature to so many people here already. That you would have been using these tools in everything you do, but you'd also like, I use it here, but never there. Where we, we, there are going to be those norms, we just don't know what they are yet. Um, I wanted to return back to the idea of intention versus impact. And mm -hmm. earlier on in the lecture, you had mentioned entering prompts in English and receiving answers in English. Perhaps this comes from my own lack of understanding of how AI works, but is there some situation where there could be something lost in translation? Say if I ask for a question, but then ask that the response be in a different language, then I would receive something for which I potentially could have some impact on me or could not have some impact. Would that act <coughs> still then be defamatory if the statement has an impact to a lay person that does understand the language versus a lay person that does not. And I guess, how do we define what would that lay person be in that situation? Yeah, the chat GPT and other generative AIs, you know, tend to be, I'm an English speaker, I'm speaking to an audience in the United States. There's been a lot of focus on English language systems. And it's also the case that English dominates the internet to a degree that other languages don't. And so there's much more English language content and English, qual the quality of English inputs and outputs is higher. You can build similar systems that are trained on other languages that perform, you know, Spanish and Chinese do quite well. Uh, but if you're doing a system in Maori, then it's going to do much worse because it has much smaller volume to work from and far fewer texts, so it's going to be you know, lower quality results, and you're going to get things that are like the garbled AI generations of five years ago in English, where you know you could, uh, Janelle Shane's blog, AI Weirdness, did an amazing job collecting, like, make me new names of paint colors, or new horrifying Christmas carols, and the AI models would come up with string together words that, you know, like, like, Rudolph Nightmare, ding, ding, dong, and like, it's like these, these phrases that like, are amazing because they are uncannily not human. And that's actually the state for a lot of other languages. Translation is possible at this point. You can get ChatGPT to do ad hoc translation between languages. The quality is often terrible, that it will misunderstand idiomatic usages, it will you know, confidently make up things that are just not grammatical in the target language. And I mean, this is very, very tentative, but I'm actually thinking it's more likely at the moment that you get outputs that fail at basic linguistic competency than you get outputs that lose shades of meaning. Uh, but this is, somebody who works more hands-on with these systems might, be, might have a better take on that. I'm going to exercise my prerogative to ask you a question, which is, as you look down the road, and obviously, as you said, the scenario may be very different a year or now from now or two years from now. What are you most worried about, and what are you most optimistic about? Hmm. I am most worried about the flood of AI content. Uh, just that. I've done research on search engines and social networks, and those are contexts where the spammers didn't win, but they attacked the internet with their junk trying to sell things and persuade us of things to an extent that really degraded 
the internet's usefulness for everyone. And I worry that AI gives the spammers an enormous edge over the systems that are trying to keep them from finding the genuine human connection. The thing that I'm most optimistic about is creativity. That I see the kinds of interesting art, everything from visual art to music to games, and it's interesting, it's fun. I feel a sense of creative possibilities coming alive again in a way I haven't seen in other places yet. I'm not as excited about the business reports and the you know, dull summaries of things. I'm excited in people using AI to make things that we haven't seen before and genuinely delight and surprise us. Well, I was delighted and surprised by your actual malice image, <laughs> and I want a t-shirt. With that image. <laughs> Please join me in thanking James Grimmelman for this great speech. Thank you so much. And good night.